All right, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today we are hosting a panel discussion on the future of identity, all things identity. Um, oh, see, they love it. <laughs> they love, you guys are gonna have to cheer for, for us at the end to, to get back to them. Um, but talking about all things about identity, um, we're gonna be talking about uh, data breaches, social media, uh, software and identity as a service, um, Internet of Things, so basically the gambit of topics. And I'm, uh, my name is Michelle Waugh, by the way, and I'm the Senior Director of uh, Security Marketing at CA Technologies. Um, and with us today, we have, uh, let me get the build going, we have Nick Nichols, who is our Senior Vice President of product management and strategy at CA Technologies. Hopefully many of you uh, caught the keynote that Nick uh, uh, delivered uh, shortly uh, earlier this morning with Steve Firestone. We also have Jeremy Britton, Director of Cyber Risk Services at Deloitte and & Touche. And we have Andrash Chair, who's the Vice President and Principal Analyst for Security and Risk at Forrester Research. So, Oh, I think I want to go back. There we go. All right. So to get started, what I'd like to suggest is uh, if you could each take a moment and uh, tell a little bit more about yourself, um, okay. where you come from, and also touch on what you think is the most pressing issue or opportunity with IAM going into the future. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a big mm -hmm. one. To start off. Well. So I'm actually, you know, fairly new to CA. Uh, I've, I've been in this role for about six months. Uh, I came to CA from Gartner, where um, I was an analyst covering identity and access management for a number of years. Um, but I've also been in this industry for a very long time as well. And so I, uh, I've been on the vendor side before. I've, I've been a general manager for uh, an identity and access management business unit. Uh, I've also been vice president of product management for identity and security at another vendor as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've had an interesting opportunity to sort of see both sides and really get a sense of not only what, what's possible and what can be built, but also, um, you know, what's really happening out in the industry. And one of the things that really excited me to come to CA um, is the opportunities that we have today. I mean, I think that we're at a point right now, a, a, an inflection point, if you will, where in order to really take advantage of these wonderful opportunities that are in front of us with cloud and mobility, um, we really need to employ um, better security controls uh, to, to be able to do this with confidence, to do this securely without compromise. And as part of that though, is that we, we have to make things easier we have to make things much more transparent, so it's not something where security is coming at um, this problem from a perspective of impeding this kind of progress, but really supporting this progress moving forward. And, and I and I feel you know today you know th there's a great opportunity in this sense to to take this to the next level and uh, and to really bring these controls to protect ourselves from from and we'll be talking about this a little bit later uh, uh, you know the greater risks that we have with regard to breach. And, and that so not only are we opening up these great opportunities, but now there's even uh, a greater risk from the overall exposure that, that uh, we're facing today um, in this breach crazy world that we happen to live in. And, and I think as we put these controls in place, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to do a much better job of, of uh, making this all possible without you know, necessarily you know, losing control in the process. Great, thank you. Jeremy. Yes, thank you. Um, so I've been with Deloitte for 20 years, focused my time, different evolutions of names, but within the security area, that entire 20 years, been doing identity and access management well over, I think, 12 years, going back to some of the early technology that was first out there. So a lot of experience working a lot of different clients and companies and uh, across the different industries. Um, I, I think one of the really main things in the future going forward is how we have historically defined what identity is, and I think that's really evolving and changing to where an identity was a person. You were a person, you were the identity, and I was trying to manage how you are accessing resources, and that's really shifting to where identity is, is a digital identity now, to where it's not just a person, it, it, it's a device, it, it's a application. It could be many forms of things, but it still needs to have the proper security and protection around it. 
and I think that's really evolving right now, and it's, it's going to fastly evolve, and the technologies and the processes are going to need to keep up with it in order to keep it properly secured. Anresh Chair, I'm an analyst with Forrester Research looking at uh, identity and access management and fraud management and cloud security. A nice uh, <clears throat> collection of hobbies, if you will. So it's uh, <laughs> lots of things to look at. And to answer your question, Michelle, um, definitely loss, of, loss of, of data, right, and how you actually protect data without the old school network perimeter, VPN, all, that, all those si sorts of ne network controls in the enterprise, so protection of data with identity contacts, right? How do you understand who has access to what pieces of data in the organization? Uh, second point I would raise is uh, customer experience, and, and Nick mentioned this. Uh, you can actually be successful as a business if you have a decent customer experience and security customer experience on your website, or you can fail and you can actually shrink as a business if you, if you are not serving, serving customers. So we at Forrester call this the age of the customer. The, the only new thing about it is that you have such big power of social media and bloggers out there that if, if you fail to provide a good user experience that includes security, that includes single sign-on, uh, terms and conditions management, registration, enrollment on your website, you are going to actually uh, suffer behind your competition. Um, and lastly, I would talk a little bit about the interplay between identity management and, and the payment industry. So what, what's interesting there is uh, the whole payment story using credit cards in the past has been all around, hey, here's my piece of plastic, that is my identity. And obviously that is not a tenable proposition, right? This is 60 years old technology that it, that it begs to be updated. So identity authentication, uh, securing payments with, with re really strong identities is, is something uh, that, that we're seeing. And lastly, uh, moving away from passwords. Yeah. So basically, uh, the power of computers has, has just grown so much in the past three to five years that you can crack passwords relatively easily. And I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow at 10.30 in my presentation. But uh, the whole idea that passwords are, are a, a good enough uh, credential set with your username is just going away. So if, if you look at all these breaches, if you look at all the passwords that were cracked, hacked, um, we, we need to move to the next level and use or augment passwords, at least initially, with biometrics, risk-based authentication, things that actually do not impact the customer experience. Great, thank you. So it's related a little bit to what you've all been talking about. Obviously, it's the core of identity and access management is this you know, enablement, but also protection. So you and Steve, Nick, talked about the constant onslaught of data breaches mm -hmm. that just continue. Um, what does the future hold in identity and access management that's going to help address this in a way that it obviously hasn't been able to over the last you know, 10, 15 years? Well, I, I think I mean I think it's a, a an interesting uh, point in the sense that when when you start looking at what's really happening in the industry today, I mean we've we've opened up a, a tremendous number of opportunities with uh, with cloud and mobility, but we've also opened up a lot of exposure, and so what what that ends up putting us in this position of where uh, you know the traditional approaches to to security tend to fall flat. It's not that they're not uh, still useful, but their their scope is no longer appropriate. Broad enough. And, and so network security, when you think about what you do with network security, you're you're trying to um, you know wrap your hands around the resource and and, and put up a, a a perimeter of defense. And there really isn't a perimeter anymore when the data can be anywhere. Um, same thing with endpoint security. You're trying to harden the endpoint, but when you're dealing with so many different endpoints it becomes untenable to try to manage all of that at that scope. And so, so it comes back to this idea of, of how identity can be really key. And if you have an understanding of what the appropriate uh, access should be, and if you understand the relationship around the, both the individuals and the things that are interacting, then, then you can start to put some, some policies that, that go across the board. I mean, it, they're, they're inherent. They're always being active. 
and these controls can help you secure this environment much more effectively. Um, and I, and I kind of feel like right now we're at this point in the, in the industry where this is about to really take off precisely because of these onslaught of breaches. Um, if you think about where we were in the past, um, identity and access management started out as, as really an operational efficiency play. Um, we started out you know, trying to provide single sign-on for, uh, uh, for convenience. We, we started out providing provisioning to, to free up the burden of uh, manual data entry for, for administrators and, and to set up these accounts and set up these entitlements in a way that was much more automated and, and, and much more uh, um, uh, you know, appropriate. And, and so that way we can enforce some of these controls. And because of that enforcement aspect of it, it became um, you know, taken to the next level where we started using this relative to uh, compliance. And how can we, um, you know, guarantee or how can we ensure compliance? Um, we started using these these technologies as a mechanism to ensure that we had the right controls in place, and we could then demonstrate that compliance and and satisfy the requirements of the auditor. Um, but in a lot of ways, at that point, what we really were saying is that the storm's coming. So a lot of organizations were focused very um, specifically on just meeting the needs of the auditor, but. Uh, in, in, but as we were really looking at it, we were identifying that if you have these controls in place and if you've actually done your homework, you'll be ready for you know, the storm that now is here. And so organizations that are still struggling at that level are, are really, uh, I think, in, in jeopardy of potentially being breached today. So that's a, that's a great point. Andras, uh, given that so many of the data breaches ultimately involve a compromised, privileged um, identity, um, what's the current maturity of companies out there? Are they ready? Are they well prepared? Or um, is that the big problem? Because that's really what Nick's talking about. I, I, would, I would say that um, a lot of organizations have been implementing privileged identity management solutions for their critical infrastructure servers. So a password safe or vault that you store all your admin mm -hmm. passwords, some session monitoring, recording, and, and that is, that is the, a good starting point. What we expect will, will happen are actually two things, right? So you have to be able to control not only your, your on-premises workloads, so all your servers, but also manage access to your cloud infrastructure. And what's interesting mm -hmm. about it is that you actually have a new set of players, right? So in the past, we used to have folks uh, on-prem ad admins who are our employees, right? We may have had um, a third-party outsourcer like Deloitte or IBM or, or whoever it was to basically help us with system administration. And now, when you look at identity infrastructure as a service, you may also see that there's a third class of ad admins that Absolutely. work for the infrastructure as a service or SaaS provider. So that's, that's one group of users that you have to be thinking of. Secondly, um, it is very important to, to understand behaviors, right? So the old school of here's this 10 admin users, right, that have access to these 15 boxes, and if, they, if, if there's any kind of a new user, we just add them to that user group, it's very limiting. So it basically, mm -hmm. you have to do a lot of policy changes, a lot of um, really hardcore kind of uh, setting, putting people into roles kind of activities. What looks like a, an easier or, or more user-friendly way of controlling users is that you actually start looking at behaviors of admins or behaviors of privileged business users to see what they usually do and create clusters or peer groups automatically based on activity and then flag if Nick and Jeremy are doing the exact kind of same things and Andras is, is typically doing the same exact kind of administration activity but now he's exporting the entire database of customers, right, mm -hmm. on a Friday night. Why is that? What is there an explanation? So looking at uh, user behavior analytics in the privileged identity management space, I think, will be a, a definite game changer moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I've noticed, too, and, and uh, speaking to a number of customers as well, is that uh, there, there's a maturity model here as well. And it's interesting to see that because 
a lot of the infrastructure as a service capabilities or the private cloud capabilities tend to be something that, that gets focused on more from the DevOps side than the security side, that there's this inherent uh, you know, lag uh, of, of putting these controls in place. And so often, you know, it, it used to be that, well, gee, I trusted these guys, they stood up the servers for me, um, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, just let them keep standing up, and they're the ones that have the, the AWS root account, and they're the ones that have the, you know, the VMware administrative accounts. Um, and, and often, while they're, at least I've seen within some customers, where they're starting to use privileged account management around their operating systems or their applications or their databases, they've overlooked this whole area of, of locking down actually the more critical resources because you're standing all these other servers on top of this um, infrastructure. And, and so I think that's another area that I think that as we start looking at this, um, you know, companies really need to think about how we can um, protect those resources as well. Yep. And just to take a little bit of a different tack, which I think everybody's way behind on privilege access management. I mean, they just started implementing these types of products over the past, I would say, year and a half, two years. Mm. And the ones that did have it before that, it was you know, the back-end IT people that were doing it because it was some cool tool that they thought they could utilize to help ma better manage, which is the same way identity mm -hmm. management started. And yep. Somebody thought it was a cool IT tool. And there's not enough of a business focus on what the risks are and what needs to be done there that it's not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, it needs to have more protection. And we talk a lot about the company and the cloud. It, it moves way beyond that. Yeah. Because a lot of the breaches of what happened with the breach, it wasn't that they breached that company. It's that they breached a third party two, two, two ways away that already had access into that environment and they piggybacked on that. And another key thing is, you know, the why while the breaches are successful is it's easier to use hacking tools than to use this IT software that we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple as that. <laughs> they make it so easy to use from wow. a hacking perspective that it's successful. The, the other thing that comes to mind, right, is, you know, this is all about the applications that you know exist within your constraints and in your organizational boundaries that are we call them sanctioned applications or, mm -hmm. or non-shadow. And, and there's a lot of apps, right? Mm -hmm. Typically software as a service kind of applications where line of business, things that hey, IT, IT security can help me. I, I better go out and reimburse like a monthly bill of $30,000 on my personal credit card and just go with that. So not only mm -hmm. you don't understand what services you have, but you don't even have a chance to actually control the security and privileged identity management, data movement, business user provisioning, deprovisioning, right. as it relates to your own organization. Well, but the data actually is there. Right? Exactly, well and another thing too, I mean you bring up SaaS applications. Um, when you look at it again, it, we, we tend to focus on the convenience and not the control. And so what ends up happening more often than not is, is that we'll set up um, single sign-on to a SaaS application. We'll, we'll set up the federation relationship, but the, um, the agreement of federation is not really being followed. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is more often than not, the applications themselves end up creating their own copies of the identity, which then really, and because they're not managed outside of that environment, they're not part of the controls that you have in place where you're managing your own copies yep. of the identity. And so now, now that just opens up and increases the attack surface. More and and to take that a step further, which nobody ever reads, is the terms and agreements, mm -hmm. um, conditions <laughs> that you have with those SaaS agreements, which they take no liability with loss of data That's or exactly anything right. else. It's set up that way and everybody signs up and for you it. And you have no control, but you're liable. Just like, Google, right. you're just like Google, when you're using Google Docs, you no longer own those documents. They're theirs to do what they want with. Yep. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about social media, social log on, and uh, again, earlier today, Steve Firestone in the opening session talked about um, this notion of um, how easy it is to get uh, a list of who the administrators are for a company, get information about them off of their social media, Facebook, and then use that to social engineer their way in. And so companies are um, thinking about how to control what their employees are not allowed to do with social media. Um, Andrush, is that, do you agree with that? Is that I mean, the path? Are customers struggling with that question? We, we got that question all the time and you know, it, there's, if you try to disable access to your employees completely, right, to all social media, 
chances are that gen generation Y or Z kind of users, <laughs> right? They are. I'm, I'm too old, right, to be one of those. But, <laughs> but basically, they, they'll, they'll go someplace else, right? So if you, if you have no access to your Facebook feed, the whole world comes to an end, right? I mean, <laughs> God forbid you need to check it or on yourself. How am I going to show the pictures right? of my cat, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so you have to be able to actually uh, somehow sanction access or control access to social media. Um, data leak prevention has been, uh, I think that is probably the key concern of, of organizations that they, they're able to intercept traffic, understand what data is actually moving to uh, those uh, social media sites. And, and really um, having a comprehensive set of controls, right, for employees accessing these sites uh, in an invisible fashion, I think that is, that, that is the key. So controlling access will just, you know, or, or limiting access or forbidding access to social media will just lead to people uh, picking a, 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 a different proxy server for their web browser that will allow them to get to those sites, right? right. So it's just... Uh, yeah, I, I find it amazing how much social media has become part of business, That's which, what I was you know, ask, in yeah. the days past, you didn't mix those things. I don't want my coworkers knowing who my family members are, my best friend when I was out at Vegas getting drunk at some bar and posting pictures. <laughs> you didn't want all your coworkers knowing that, but now nobody cares and it seems to not go away. Um, I think which uh, I think one of you brought up is th that's not gonna change because it seems to be more and more. So it needs to move to how can you secure it in risk-based profiling to understand the behavioral aspects of the people, I think it's key to go forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to do something else. It's not gonna be, like you said, it can't be a password. It, it has, and if you're gonna trust somebody from a social environment, you gotta you got find another way to do it, and it has to be behavioral. Right, and, well, and there's another aspect of this, too, is, I mean, first off, you know, just as, as both of you have alluded, uh, we're not gonna be able to stop people from sharing. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, it is kind of the, the, the nature of all of this is sharing this information. But part of this is that a lot of this information that we're sharing is identifiable information about you that is often used in many cases to even proof your identity. So when you go to a bank and you're talking about certain things that, that, uh, that you've done or certain transactions that you've had or information about your home, information about, th this is now very readily available you know, from an easy search. Some of it's being exposed through social media, some of it's just available because we've gotten that much better at collecting this information and making it readily um, you know, visible through, through a simple search. And, and so that changes the dynamic a little bit in the sense that, that we can't just rely on secrets anymore as the basis for security. And, and so we have to put in other controls. I mean, there's still going to be aspects of things that you know that's going to be uniquely identifiable, but we have to deal with you know, better controls around multi-factor, other approaches that we can bring to bear to get a stronger um, you know, proofing of the identity in order to be um, truly secure. And uh, what, what, you know, what, what is the shoe size of your grandmother kind of question <laughs> or, or, the, or the favorite <laughs> color, what streets you grew up and all that. Th those, these pieces of information, are readily available so yes. on the other hand right you, you can also we've seen some some offerings and initial thinking of, of vendors doing identity proofing the typical identity vetting proofing and avoiding synthetic identity kind of applications for loans and mortgages types of things or credit cards ruining your 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 credit history mm -hmm. moving or being augment augment augmenting the traditional LexisNexis types of mm -hmm. types of identity vetting and proofing knowledge-based authentication mm -hmm. services. So an, an idea, right? If you have your Facebook profile correctly uh, secured and your privacy settings are all good, you could use that information or Facebook or a social media provider, LinkedIn, Twitter could provide a service that, would, that could be used for uh, vetting identity. So an, an onboarding question would be, okay, we understand you're Andrash, who out of these five people are, are not your friends, right? Or, you know, where have you not lived in the past, you know, 15 years? It's self-asserted information. Yeah. I, I'm a little concerned with that just because it, the, I, I think while it, it, it provides some convenience and I think there's some interesting aspects to this, the problem is, is that that information is still becoming so easily discoverable. So, yeah. so, so even though you might not know what the question is in advance, 
if you built up a big enough profile and you spent enough time, um, I think even those could be defeated. But, but I, I do agree that there has to be additional controls in place where, where we are providing many avenues of vetting the identity in order to be secure. And that, that knowledge base by itself is, is becoming eroded precisely because of the, the uh, information that's being readily available. Another aspect of, of social media control, right? So when somebody's tweeting on, on behalf of a company, right, or, mm -hmm. or, or managing a Facebook profile of a company, you have to be super careful about it. I'm sure you've seen the US Air kind of fiasco out there, right? And then various others. Another privileged, uh, Another privileged administrator. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more visibility than your active directory domain controller, for sure. Right, right. right? So let's switch gears again and talk about um, identity as a service, software as a service. It continues to be a key consideration in the area of identity and access management. Um, and not only for, um, you know, sort of mid-market or emerging organizations that are sort of going all SaaS, but the largest enterprises and government agencies are now uh, seriously considering and implementing these kinds of solutions. So, Andres, if you could start on sort of what are the requirements going into the future around IDAS compared to where we've been so far in the maturity of it? So, there's, you can think of, you know, I think of identity as a service, as a two by two matrix, and I hope I, I can help you visualize that, right? So one, one uh, column is basically whether you host the solution on premises, the identity and access management solution on premises, or is it, is it living in the cloud, IDAS? And the, the other uh, the roles right, in this matrix, whether your applications and data that you need to control by identity and access management is on premises or in the cloud, right, or is a, as a cloud service. So, so if you look at, um, the on-premises identity and access management tool thing, you know, we figured it out, right? But there's a lot of organizations that say, hey, we've already built a huge, say, CA infrastructure for identity and access management. We have been satisfying these, you know, 1,349, you know, requirements that Deloitte implemented for us, right? <laughs> um, it's great that we, we need to go to the cloud, but how are we going to be able to, A, cover our existing on-premises stuff, i.e. apps and data, and how do we extend this to, to our cloud workloads, right? So that's, this is the not so, you know, where you got legacy baggage, right? And that is, by and large, the majority of the Fortune 500 companies out there. There's not a lot of organizations out there that are really kind of greenfield in this space. So, there's a transitional aspect as to how you can have an on-premises identity and access management system coexist and, and, and collaborate with a cloud-based solution, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's definitely that. And for smaller organizations where you got a greenfield opportunity, it's again, how well can your cloud-based IDAS, identity as a service, or cloud-based identity management system manage the entire uh, gamut of identity and access management use cases. So it's not just single sign-on into cloud workloads, not just two-factor authentication, but more advanced things like provisioning, user account provisioning, access request management, governance of access. So basically, be a be-all, end-all solution without actually needing an on-premises tool. Mm -hmm. right? And that is some, we're not quite there yet, I don't think. I, I, I mean, cl cloud's been around for quite a long time. I mean, ADP's been doing SaaS for, well, since I can remember, and I'm kind of old, so <laughs> it, it's been there. So we've been dealing with it for quite a long time. Um, I, I think there's a different approaches that people need to take and look at it, whether they're going to do identity of service, whether they do uh, on-premise, whether they do, quite frankly, a lot of it's going to be a combination. Um, you have very few companies that are true startups that have the ability to really go a fully cloud-based SaaS road. It's just they already have enabled infrastructure internally and they got to deal with the hybrid. Um, I, I think really what, what I, the key is is having people that are truly focused on identity management and understanding what the security implications are and having proper governance processes. So a lot of what's happening now is that a business unit, because they don't want to be tied down by the security group, they're going off and signing up to do some cloud-based application and not going and talking to security or having a governance process around it, 
you know, and, and partially that's the fault of some of the legacy security groups because, you know, their answer to everything was, well, we, we got to secure it and shut it down, and it down. so that yeah. it, it becomes a roadblock and a stop sign, so they don't go to them. And I think that that philosophy needs to change to where, you know, security can still be an enabler to allow you to do things. You still got to have the proper controls, but we got to make it so that it can advance and they can businesses can still serve their customers. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I, I hate being the guy that says no, <laughs> so uh, so I wholeheartedly agree. I say and, no to my kids. But. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I also think that you know, because definitely hybrid models are going to persist. Um, I think that it has a lot to do with you know a number of factors. Some of it is how much control um, the organization wants to maintain too. I mean, there are examples where where sometimes you know companies uh, have. You know, made investments. They're frustrated. They they've recycled their their infrastructure because it it, it was either too brittle or, or or too locked down, and they needed to make changes. And so they ended up going through this pattern a few times. So a lot of them are looking to consume this as a service, as a way out. Something where hey, I don't want to maintain that expertise. I want somebody else to do it for me. Um, so I think there's going to be a little bit of that. But I, don't, I but I also think that there's an aspect of this where um, even given the choice, they still want to maintain on-prem capabilities because they need to have that tighter control. And so I think there's a balance. And actually a really good example, um, if you look back to uh, um, what was going on with Microsoft in Office 365, is that uh, Microsoft was pushing really, really hard to get everybody to go to Office 365 in a way that they were even um, not uh, providing features in anything but the Office 365 variant. And so all of the on-prem office uh, models were actually being deprecated. And uh, there was a huge pushback from the customer base saying, uh, wait a minute, no, I need this on-prem too. Um, some of my constituency, you know, maybe my general population I'm going to put in Office 365, but I, I need to have, let's say for my exchange, um, I need to have more control over my executive's email. And so I need to have that on-prem and I need to have these new features. And so Microsoft had to backpedal from this, this really hardcore push to everything to the cloud to recognize that, wait a minute, no, this is going to persist for quite some time. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that, that we're seeing is that um, a lot of IT, IT security organizations, as, as you, know, you guys mentioned, were the notorious department of no, right? N-O, right? And, and I, we're seeing a transition that you're actually wanting to become more of, a, of an architectural body in the IT security organization, more of, a, of an architect type of, type of organization that looks at various vendors, various cloud providers, infrastructure as a service, SaaS kind of providers, security offerings, and tries to understand how you can pull all this together and, and to become the department of K-N-O-W, right, from the department of N-O. So at least have some visibility as to what's happening. I mean, you know, Forrester, we went through that transformation. It wasn't easy. It, it, it involves basically letting go in a lot of places. So, and, and finding the right tools to actually monitor access, monitor behavioral patterns, and look at things that you have not been looking at before. So Andres, what about user managed access? How does that play into? Sure, so, so if you look at the general consumption of user attributes, right, when you, and this is another example of employees accessing mm -hmm. social media, but also consumers accessing your customer facing website, right? People don't want to let go of their personal details and attributes like address, name, uh, in some cases, social security number and all that. Uh, they want to have, uh, very fine-grained control of who, as a service provider, is authorized to use that data and what they can do with that data, or how they can manage that data. So uh, user-managed access today is, is not yet a reality, but if you look three, four years down the path, um, we, we see some questions from, from large banks, right, how they can uh, move to uh, managing their terms and conditions, right, for users, right, when, they, when, when you have a, uh, a customer that is involved across multiple lines of businesses, mm -hmm. right, they may have a credit card, a loan, an online banking relationship, how you can manage attributes and, and, and key uh, uh, profile elements, right, online and, and who's authorized to look at that data, how you're able to use that for marketing purposes and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
So that's, that's probably going to be the beginning of it. And uh, so larger organizations, uh, banks, telcos, mobile network operators, uh, accepting and adopting user managed access and basically allowing the user to uh, manage what the, what the company has access to, what the profile attributes the company has access to. And then it will basically find broader adoption across other sites. And, and I think that's a good first step, although there, there are some issues there that, I'd be, that I'm a little concerned with, is that um, you know, as part of this, you're, you're putting in some constraints around sort of the authorization of, of this information that's in the claim. And uh, it really becomes dependent on the recipient as to whether they honor those restrictions. And today, if you think about what's going on in Federation in general, they weren't supposed to unpack it and cop make a copy of the identity in the first place. Oh, yeah. so, so it's like, how are we going to enforce those kinds of controls? Um, and, and so, so I, I think, like I said, it, it's, it's a good step in the right direction. It's starting to think about what, what we should do to, to uh, respect and honor the fact that, that an individual might have certain information that, that should only be used for certain purposes. But I also think that there needs to be other kinds of enforcement points. And, and you know, some of the things that, that could really help with, with that aspect of things with regard to um, giving power back to the individual um, around their identity information is, is to you know, set up other constructs where, where they're basically abstr abstracting their identity in a way from, for these kinds of relationships. And I think that's something that also needs yeah. to be examined. And there's it, a personal it, governance aspect yeah. about this that you need to be able to understand who you, you know, what you did in user managed access, right? So here's my complete mm -hmm. view of all these permissions I gave to, to others, sorry. Uh, just say, it's, it's going to be a bit of a paradox, I mean, because there's companies of which their business model is to sell data about other people. That's exactly right. So the data is out there and it's being sold, that's how they make their money. Yeah. So it's going to go somewhere, it's a, and it's going to be a, how you manage it, it's, it's not going to be easy and it's going to be complex and it, it's, need a focused effort on it because yeah, your data's being sold every day. That's yeah. exactly right. So there's a lot of privacy implications that Correct. go way beyond Absolutely. identity and access management and security. So Jeremy, you mentioned earlier about the notion of uh, the, you know, the sort of the simple idea of a digital identity that isn't tied to an actual person. How is that driving the future of identity and access management for all of us? Yeah, that's the, which I, love to hate the uh, Internet of Things, um, which I don't know who came up with that terminology, but it, it, it is a I love really... love it. <laughs> <laughs> you connected gadgets. Connected gadgets. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, very, it's very interesting because, yeah, your identity as a person, it, it's evolving to where you're going to have, you know, 50 to 100 identities in your house alone, um, whether it's your smart door, your smart meter, your baby monitor that you can log into remotely, all of those things uh, have a, a, an identity of themselves and they need to have the proper security authentication authorizations of who's getting to them, who can go through them. Um, so it, it's definitely a shift. Um, you know, the, the number of devices out there is, you know, you know, I don't know what they say, quadruple, 10 times, whatever it is. And, you know, we focused and a lot of the technologies are focused on protecting identities as a person. So now I got to move into a device, and quite frankly, you know, which I, I think they're getting a little bit behind on already, is that the the companies are racing to market with all of these smart devices and putting out the firmware, and the firmware itself has security flaws. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's the start. Before I even put any software on it, my underlying firmware has already got problems, which is creating additional problems. And then you you know you got to work through is you know your system development life cycle is are you doing that in a secure way. And, you know, a lot of companies, you know, especially which, you know, our app dev folks that are over there, you know, they want to build a cool application. They don't want to build in security. And security is an afterthought a lot of times, and it needs to become part of the process from the upfront side. Absolutely. And, and the other aspect to this, too, is it's not just the access to the device, but these devices or these sensors or, or these appliances are generating all of this data. And access to that data it needs to be secured as well. Uh, and so when you start thinking about this, like from a healthcare perspective, you, you, you're you know, now putting you know, smart watches on you and other devices that are monitoring your health and emitting this data out on the internet. 
and how much of that do you really want to yeah. share with everybody? I mean, I know we have a sharing economy now, but, but maybe there's such a thing as sharing too much information. Yeah. Uh, and so having controls around that as well, as well as having access to um, the different devices, or as we even showed uh, earlier uh, this morning about you know, the, the fact that even you know, your cars can be uh, compromised. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it, it becomes this one, of, I mean, we need to take time to put in these controls and we need to be working through this, not just from a vulnerability perspective, but all, you know, across the board, yeah. as far as making sure that the right access is being managed. And so, so it really comes back to another, going back to the first question, you know, this is what I think is going to make the identity and access management market explode. I think that this is on the verge of, of a huge amount of growth, precisely because this is the only way we can really address this at a fundamental level. And the, you know, but IOT or connected gadgets, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them, right? <laughs> your your uh, c connected light bulb kind of thing or mm -hmm. connected Nuki. You know, I heard that. You know, there's a there's a lot of <laughs> lot of good use cases, right? But um, th I think the whole connected gadgets world will be a battlefield or a very you know fierce competition area of the security control plane, right? Uh, so who's going to control all, all your devices in your home? Is it going to be you, the end user? So is it, is it going to be a consumer play? Or is it going to be uh, the organization that manages? So for example, Mandalay Bay has you know, 47,922 sensors that they have a control plane for that. Right? That's another opportunity. Or is this going to be owned by the device manufacturers? They're all Honeywell sensors, so they basically have Honeywell managing. So mm -hmm. that's... That's, that's another thing, and, and I'm, 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 I very much hope that we'll figure this out before we're going to have uh, another major attack, denial of service attack, you know, uh, from all these connected gadgets. So my, my estimate is that if you look at the number of mobile devices today, you could say probably seven to eight billion mobile devices, and you can kind of, but it's in the single digit billions, right? Connected gadgets, I think, are going to go somewhere in, in the hundreds of billions of range. So two orders of magnitude more than what we have today. So if all these get taken over for, uh, for an attack, right, the botnet attack or denial of service attack, we'd better have some way of controlling the, the, these little gizmos. So. Very good. So we're getting close to the end of our 45 minutes. I would ask if each of you could just take a moment and thinking about uh, all of these folks sort of spending the next day and a half, two days out here thinking about identity and access management and security, what's a key takeaway that they should sort of be thinking about as they go about the next couple of days? I'll let you start. Uh, look at data, right? That is your, you know, nobody cares about my active directory, you know, group memberships, right? Uh, Look at your data, look at who has access to what data, that's, that's one thing. Second thing, look at, understand behavioral patterns and get out of the habit of coding pointed rules-based policies and look at what's normal behavior and how you can build a baseline off of that and how you can detect anomalies off of that. So that's the second thing. And thirdly, understand what you have, take an inventory of, of the systems that you have today you know, the amount of legacy baggage you have in terms of apps, data, identity and access management processes and policies, and think about how you can kind of get out of those shackles. Because you can save a ton of money if, if you at least augment your on-prem identity and access management portfolio with cloud-based offerings. Um, I, I would say as you're going through this, you know, the technology and everybody comes because the technology is kind of cool, it's kind of interesting, it's fun to do. But it's really, if, if you're a security professional, look and understand the other areas of what the processes are, how you as a security person can integrate into the business. So you're augmenting the business from a security perspective and not just be the outside guy saying no. Um, if you're not in security, pay attention to security and look what needs to be done and how important it is, you know, not, not just to the company, but you as a person and what your data is that's getting out there and is insecure. Very good. And, and also, I mean, there, there's a lot of overlap when you start talking about security relative to a lot of the other things that are going on at the show here today. Um, whether you're talking about uh, development or operations, uh, being able to understand how you know, these realms actually come together. And that, that 
if you take a, a little bit of time to, to sort of recognize where um, security can really enhance what you're doing from a development standpoint and how you can build security in, as well as from an operations standpoint, how you can really orchestrate um, your processes in a much more secure way and not treating this as an afterthought. I, I think you'll find that, that this will make this so much easier um, down the road. Um, from, from my experience, when, when we end up having the most challenges, it tends to be because we, we go down a certain path for a while and then find out, whoa, wait a minute, now I need to do something. If we start in, you know, taking this to heart earlier in the process and embedding this capability throughout, um, it, it'll make uh, the experience that much better. Great. Well, with that, I will say thank you to our great panelists. And uh, I think we had a great, insightful discussion. Um, so I appreciate your time and, and those of you in the audience as well. Um, and we have uh, a, lot of, a lot more sessions, a lot more content to cover. Uh, tomorrow morning, Andras will be kicking off with uh, a session uh, looking into the future as well. Um, later on this afternoon, uh, Mo Rosen and our partners at VMware are going to talk about some of the new announcements that we made today around privileged access management. Um, and uh, we have some great roadmaps that uh, are coming up as well. So please enjoy. Thank you.